Welcome to another episode of the Better Learning Podcast. I'm excited and honored to have guests that we have on today. Somebody who's been very influential through their career. Um, and Edie Hirsch Jr. is here. And um, and I first welcome. I appreciate you taking time to talk. I'm glad to, to hear that you send this out to a lot of schools. That's yeah, fine from uh, my point of view. <laughs> So for, I think a lot of our audience is familiar with your work, whether they're familiar with your name or not, um, but you've written several books, influential on the curriculum in this country, as well as other countries. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of start back of like, why do you think you chose kind of your life's work in education? Uh, it was totally an accident. Uh, the reason I, I got uh, deeply involved in reading uh, which is a big shortcoming from the standpoint of uh, equity and uh, fairness, and because uh, I, I was particularly struck uh, recently on that point by the work of Professor Philip Cohen in, in the University of Maryland. Uh, he showed that a teenager's score on the Armed Forces reading test uh, predicted their income as adults. Think of it. Reading score on as a teenager predicts how much money you're going to make. So that's a pretty blunt measure yeah. of equity and, and fairness uh, in, in its relation to education. Yeah, it's amazing so that, how one, did that one skill set. Reading and reading scores. Well, for one thing, uh, I have done work in uh, theory of reading. It's in, in my de original department, which was uh, literature and humanities. Uh, it's called hermeneutics, theory of interpretation, but that gets you into reading. It gets you into general views of language. And it turned out that for you and me to communicate well in language or to do well on a reading test, uh, there's a lot of unstated things you have to know to get the answers to the test question. If you go back to the famous baseball experiment, right, that uh, kids who were terrible readers on, the, on most of the reading tests uh, did extremely well when the subject was baseball and they knew about <laughs> baseball. And uh, uh, kids who were good readers, but didn't know much about baseball, did terribly in the baseball experiment. So that suggested that what's important in reading in every case, that it can be generalized. And this is the important point because people believe in general reading ability. There is no such thing as general reading ability. It is a congeries of individual reading abilities depending on your knowledge of the topic topic knowledge and uh, more generally shared knowledge is, is what makes you a good reader. Now the whole American educational child-centered tradition is based on the idea that there's a general reading skill. I don't know if you're familiar with that tradition, but in any case, it's thought you have classroom libraries and kids can read on different subjects as they wish to, to right. read, because that's what interests them and so on. But it turns out that there is no general reading ability. So the whole uh, raison d'etre of the classroom libraries and individualized reading uh, misses out on the implications of the baseball experiment. I think everybody knows that experiment, that's why. So that suggests that the reason our verbal scores have gone down rather precipitately, if you look at the, at the uh, verbal SAT, which is, it, it looks like a ski slope, you wouldn't want to <laughs> ski down. We've done terrible for that. That's from about 1950 to 1990. It's just a terrible drop. And the reason was this theory that reading is a, is a general skill and kids can read whatever they want. That's what made our scores drop. And that's bad for the country because reading correlates with a lot of other things, including politics. 
which uh, has become debased recently. So the country really, <laughs> my bottom line is, we need to quit doing what we're doing and doing something new. So it's a rather revolutionary, radical position, even though everybody calls me a conservative. So looking at that and then like really kind of like your your main book of in 1987, Cultural Literacy, really kind of sparked some of the changes. Uh-huh. What, what changes did you see after that? Did you see like what are, what are kind of like your well, experience it, going that through? That made like, very one... little difference in 87. Uh, isn't that when it came out? 80, yeah, 87. 87. Yep. Um, of course, <laughs> everybody got interested in it. It became a bestseller because uh, everyone wanted to see what they thought you needed to know. And there was a list of what you need to know. And that's the reason. Uh, the book sell, sold. I wasn't. <laughs> that it was not my intention to write a bestseller, and, and <laughs> suddenly that, that's what happened. It, it, and I was able to start a foundation with the uh, proceeds from uh, 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 the royalties, and that foundation has done there at least a. I, I can't remember the number of core knowledge schools now, but it's in the thousands and. Uh, it's it's very it's I, I for an old man it's quite nice to <laughs> to know that 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 a lot of kids are getting a good education. Yeah. So do you so do you feel like it's still the track as now? And, and I don't know how much kind of you know you, you hit it pretty clear like it's gotten very political, especially the last couple of years. But I think there's been politics intertwined for a long time. But. He, do you feel like um, there's been improvement from kind of the late 80s versus where we're on now? Or do you think well, it's still no, kind I of mean, going the, the wrong, the, wrong uh, track? The scores have gone down. And uh, there hasn't been improvement. And, and what happened, and particularly in my particular case, what happened was the idea that you needed shared background knowledge in order to read well. You know, you need to know some of the unstated things that was in the mind of the author to pass a reading test. Well, think of it. I think that's a really good entree for your audience into this subject. You want your kids to do well on that reading test. Well, what is a reading test? Think of it. It's, it's, you get a passage and there are usually four distractors asking you which of these is the, is the right implication. But notice that word implication, they're not asking you what does it literally stay. They want in those distractors, they want to know what did, did that passage imply? That means what did it convey that it did not say? Okay, that's the nature of a reading test. Well, how do you know what it didn't say? You have to know some of the things in that baseball study, for example. You have to know some of the things that uh, the author is taking for granted. Right. You have to know some of the implications. And how do you know which implications you need to know to, to read all these things? Well, authors and editors and people in the general public have kind of got a sense of what they need to explain and what they don't need to explain to make language very efficient. So that means we all have to have a, a certain amount of common knowledge or shared knowledge. This is true for oral uh, uh, communication as well as uh, lit- reading and literacy. Yeah. But that suggests the kids need to learn a lot of the same things. That, that that's an interesting something yeah. that's opposite to what child-centered education is saying. So when you're saying child-centered ed- education, that's more of like I'd say some of the terms we hear now of like student-centered or like individualized education. I'm sorry, say it a little louder. Um, the kind of the buzzwords that we hear now is a lot of like student-centered or individualized oh, yeah. student. No, the and, trouble and with we're that saying the same thing. Student-centered and child-centered education is. The idea that you can get a general reading, the the only way that's possible is if you can get a general reading skill 
uh, by reading things that are very absorbing to the individual child and interesting. And of course, that's a wonderful, humane idea. The trouble is uh, it doesn't make you literate and our, liter our reading scores have gone down. If you, if you want more social justice, if you want the reading scores to go up, you better start teaching everybody a lot of the same things. And, and then what happens is if you advocate that, then you'll say that's oh, Anglo-centric or uh, you know, it's not taking everybody's culture into account. Well, I think the important thing to convey to your audience, the people in the schools, is that the aim of the schools in a nation is, is really well, to create intelligent voters in a democracy. And the way to create literate, intelligent uh, voters is to be able to read and communicate and understand. And that can only be done if you understand language. Everybody talks about AI, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, does all these things. But artificial intelligence and chat, GPT, is, yeah, chat yep. box and so on, they have to learn the background knowledge that, that I'm talking about. Otherwise, chat couldn't do what it uh, no. supposed to do. And no. if AI has to do that, you, you can bet a, a child has to as well. Yeah. Uh, to understand the language. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the chat GPT, all they're doing is they're just looking at his at other texts and trying to predict what's the next word. So it's just kind of emulating other writing that's already out well, there. Well, how does it make that prediction? Well, it probably does it on a frequency basis. But exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, you can't, the, the, the person doesn't need to do it on a frequency basis. You know, you want the, the individual who's very literate say, what is the probability in this context of what that means? And to do that, you have to share some of the same orientations that the writer or the speaker had. So you have to be sort of in cahoots with one another, you and the writer and the, or the speaker. Yeah. So, uh, so one of the things that you're talking about is, is the test scores. And there's a lot of people that are saying, well, the issue isn't that they're, we're not reading as well. It's just that the tests aren't set up correctly uh, how, how much do you kind of put into that of like i would is, rephrase that that's hard for me to understand it isn't yeah. that the kids aren't reading well the tests are not set up correctly <laughs> I, I mean we all have to communicate with one another are you telling me if you don't if i don't understand what you're saying then i the speaker am wrong uh, and not you the listener i mean that's, a, that's essentially what's being said in that remark. I think it's an evasive, if you want to know, my, the tests aren't set up because they're giving you an unpleasant uh, <laughs> piece of information. The tests are very similar to the way they've been. And how do you explain in that case why suddenly <laughs> this format of the test, which I, which I started out explaining, I mean, tests, reading tests, there's a marvelous statement by uh, Dan Willingham. He's a distinguished cognitive psychologist. He said, a, a reading test is a knowledge test in disguise. Well, from what we've just been talking about, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That to, to grasp the implication, to choose the right item from those four items, you have to get the implication. Well, what's the basis for getting the right implication? Because an implication is something that's not stated in the text. Yeah. So that leads you to think that you have to know some of the same things that the author is taking for granted. And if you're talking to a general public, the general public needs to know. I mean, you know, the stuff you read in a newspaper or in a book. So everybody has to have in a, in a particular nation or a, or a culture, has to have some of the same background knowledge so they can understand what people are saying, what the implications yeah. are. So it's interesting you phrase it this way. I hadn't kind of put it together until I'm talking to you and hearing this, but I feel like part of our issues in our country right now is that we do not have, like we're not doing shared experiences. Like 
you know, if you look back 40, 50, however long ago, where you only had three major networks and, you know, everyone in the city was reading the same newspaper. Now it's so fragmented that everyone is getting their information kind of more individualized. And it sounds like you're, you're, you're hitting kind of, the nail on the head. You're, you're and, talking about the same thing as like, well, if we're yeah. not doing any shared contents from the beginning, I, I mean, it's going to be continue to be fragmented. Think of it this way. By far, this is the richest country in the world. I think we have about one third of the total wealth of all the nations. We're immensely rich. Now, how, how, the, how that gets distributed, that's a big political question. But we are 25th in the PISA scores, what our 15-year-olds know and can do in the International Assessment of Educational Progress. So are we willing to blame that on uh, our educational theories? Think of it. I mean, we could if we wanted to, if we were operating on the right uh, theories. Theories are terribly important. I mean, the country is based on a theory. The whole United States is based on a theory. The theory we've been operating on, this child-centered orientation, which gives kids a different curriculum, as it were, each kid with a slightly different curriculum in, in, the, in the classroom libraries and all that, that is a bad educational idea if your country needs everybody to have some of the same background knowledge in order to understand or each other or to pass a reading test or to see through scoundrels if they're on the political scene. We, we all be, need to be able to learn better and communicate better by having shared background knowledge. But it is when you when you factor in like how political it's been now, like, well, then it's a matter of like, well, what is that shared thing that we need to it's do? It's been made, wait, well, hold on. Right. It's been made political, actually. There are two theories about how you solve uh, the problem of uh, people having different cultures in, in one country. Uh, one theory is, well, everybody should be represented, and that's very popular now, and a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And we've been doing it, and reading scores have been going down. There's another way of accommodating everybody, and that is the idea not of multiculturalism, but of biculturalism. Every, you have your home culture, but there's a public culture as well. And they are not the same. Our reading scores used to be better because you, we operated on a theory that's now much disparaged, and that is the assimilationist idea. But you don't have to assimilate, become a different culture or adapt, uh, adapt another culture. You just have to know two cultures. Biculturalism is the solution to our problem. And the schools have a duty to convey the culture that's shared by everybody, which, is, which I call, there's a term that linguists use, which is called the graphalect. That's a fan, that doesn't sound very cultural. It's not uh, going to hurt anybody. The graphic is just the language of the printed word. And, and this, this great author, Ch Shinua Achebe, who, who uh, wrote a whole little pamphlet on the need of a, of a nation to have a graphic that is a, a common uh, literary language. And the other thing that the psychologists have shown and that reading tests show is to have a common language means to have common background knowledge. You need those two things. And so my message is, as I say, it's not very complicated. <laughs> but it's well, also, it, it, it's, it's not complicated. It's, it's, yeah, it's just when, when you see what's going on around you in these communities and what school superintendents are dealing with, it, it, they're so far removed from, I, I would say, like, actually focusing on the education side of it. Um, they probably wouldn't love for me to to describe it that way, but the reality is, is they're, they're consumed by a whole bunch of things that are that it is not focused on education to kids. It's right. it's a lot of all the other kind of junk yeah, that, that yeah. fills up their time. Yeah. And and 
you know, and that's where I spend a lot of my time is like, how do they sift through that and be like, no, like, this is the most important thing because it just keeps coming at them <laughs> from both sides. And it's not always even political. It's like everything from like, from student safety and, you know, like, like all the other things that, that just kind of happen in, in, you know, in the day of life of, of an educator. I also think that they are beset by slogans that turned out not to be valid. Uh, it, I mean, this whole notion of child-centeredness turned out to be a theory that didn't work. I mean, if reading scores were higher on a different theory, why not go to the theory that gave you higher reading scores? Reading scores are at the center of learning. They're, they're at the center of social justice. I cannot see why we have persisted in, in a failed theory for so long. And yes, I, so I consider myself rather, people call me a, a conservative because they, they say, oh, this looks very conservative. But this is a pretty radical statement in regard to what the schools are doing and, and what they should be doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting because I, I, I'm not an educator. I, you know, I've, ne I've never worked inside a school, but I've worked with schools for, you know, like 15 years now. Um, and I'm digging in and as I'm talking to more people on podcasts and looking at other things is there's, there's a pretty clear um, consensus that the way we've been teaching reading over the last 20, 25 years has been wrong. Um, really, if you look at like the, like the, the sight words and by memory versus more of a phonics base where you actually like understand and can decode words. And even though we've known this for 20 years, it's still hard to change that curriculum. I mean, what, what, what have you seen? Like, do you, do you think we're still just teaching like the basics of, of, of it wrong or is it or you think it's really more of like just the the well, type of reading we're putting I, in front of I, people? I, I, I didn't uh, I don't know we don't have a lot of time I know uh, I know what, <laughs> I don't know what your schedule is but but uh the I can answer that question but you have to go into the history of ideas I mean ideas are what brought our scores down Ideas are what can bring our scores back up. And the key idea, I tell you one way to look at it. In the 30s and 40s, there was a Time magazine put out a show called The March of Time. And uh, the most influential educator uh, in our schools was John Dewey. And he was on the uh, the March of Time, several occasions, and one of them had to do with the schools. And in one of those, uh, in the 1940s, when progressive education was being introduced in a big way uh, into the country, uh, there was a March of, I, I urge everybody to look at that old March of Time. It's, it has George, it's called Education in the 1940s. And it was, it, you can, go right on the internet and see it. And at the very end, Dewey has a comment to make about the schools. He says, and I can almost quote it by heart. He says, we are not educating children for the world of the past. We are educating children for their world. And Dewey thought that he was a Hegelian. I don't know, most people don't really know the ins and outs of Hegel's philosophy. But but my friend uh, Dick Rorty called Dewey uh, a combination of Darwin and Hegel. And, and Hegel believed that we were on a march of time, that history was moving forward. And all of our graduates think that history is moving forward and so on, and the old world isn't very, very good. But what Dewey said at the end was, we, the world is, changing at a tremendous pace. Nobody knows where it's going. But still, he said, we are preparing those kids for, for that world. How, if he doesn't know where it's going, how the hell does he? It's because he and Hegel had a faith 
that God was in charge, basically. And, and the nature of the child would determine. That's what child-centered education is based on that religious principle. And, you know, you can't, there's, think about religious principles, is you, it's hard to fight them. And if you believe that the child develops, and that's why you should give the child the reading that the child wants and not what you are trying to impose on the child, then you're going to believe in that progressive idea that history is marching on. And it turns out that actually, in a lot of ways, history, well, in technology and science, history seems to march, but not necessarily in educational theories or in, uh, in a lot of other ways, including political uh, situations. And so th that whole notion that happy notion of the 1930s and 40s and the, and the romanticism of the 19th century, that's what's guiding our schools. And I think we need to take a hard-headed look back at John Locke, who says there aren't any innate ideas. That's what started the country. Locke and Hobbes and uh, say, no, everybody starts with a clean slate. And it's up to you to put on that slate what's going to make the society work. And they had another idea, it was called the social contract. And that notion was that, yes, you, the, the person, are making an agreement with the society. They're gonna take care of you and have an army and a navy to protect you and so on. But they expect patriotism from you and, and, and a sort of sense of the, the whole. And this, the reading scores have gone down, but so have our patriotism scores. So I, th I think this whole system of child-centered education has a lot of thinking to do, a lot of correcting to do. Yeah. Well, I love having this conversation with you, and I really appreciate your time. My, my last question, and I think it's a good segue from what you just said here, is how, how optimistic are you that, that we're going to turn it around in this country? Depends on how many people get convinced of this. I look at, there's a, there are seven schools in the South Bronx that, that are using this old fashioned so sort of, uh, approach to education. They're 85% below the poverty line. They're black and they're Hispanic, uh, mostly. Uh, these, these parents have no background. <laughs> these kids have run, run the citywide after the, uh, that's just K through eight. And, but, but the children who attend this kind of school, are <laughs> they get into selective high schools, they get into college, they, they win debate contests. I have this marvelous picture of them holding up the trophy of winning the, and it's because of the education they received, which was just this, everybody is studying a lot of the same things in, in the class, and therefore the next step in the class, they will understand the next lesson. And it's very cumulative because it starts in kindergarten. And, and people, the, the child-centered idea poo-poos that because they're waiting for the child to evolve and develop according to the individual child instead of according to the needs of the country and the society. That's, that's my pitch. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to... Yeah, I, I, man, I would love to like talk to you as, as long as you want to talk about things, or we can have you back on. I think <laughs> anyway, uh, I enjoyed it. And, yeah, and, thank uh, you so much. Um, yeah, for the listeners, if you already, if you're not subscribing to this, just hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening. Uh, but Edie Hirsch, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and all your work, your, your, you. yeah, your your efforts, everything through through your career. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.